Good morning, and welcome back to our EFAB Expo. As we walk down the aisle, our next booth that we're going to visit will be uh, Flex uh, CNC, Flex Machine Tools. Many of you might know Flex through the Flex arms that you've used for years in your shops to do uh, tapping. Um, as a reminder, if you reach out to us on uh, social media or if you uh, request from your sales team, we have these really cool camo hats and uh, even nicer uh, uh, shirts that uh, manufacturing makes uh, America strong. So at this point, if you are, uh, if you are machining or uh, drilling uh, long pieces or you have multiple setups, uh, Joe Taylor from Flex is going to talk to us about the, the many benefits of how uh, Flex machine tools can uh, help in your operation. So, uh, Joe, take it away. Absolutely, Kevin. Thank you for the introduction. Again, so I'm Joe Taylor uh, from Flex Machine Tools. I am the East Coast sales manager, and I also cover all of Canada. Uh, and so, as Kevin said, today we're going to talk about our Flex CNC. It's a large, open bed ver vertical machining center. Um, and, and the neat part about our machine is that it's very customizable uh, to the customer's application. So we're going to talk about that. But uh, Flex Arm, Flex CNC, Flex Machine Tools, we're located in Northwest Ohio, a small town called Wapakoneta. Uh, and so we're just, we're really happy to be here with you guys with, uh, with everything going on where trade shows aren't a thing. This is just a really cool opportunity uh, for everybody to still be able to experience the trade show, but doing it safely, doing it comfortably. So with that, uh, the Flex CNC overview that we're going to talk about, uh, we have two different types of machine. Uh, they're both vertical machining centers, but the C series and the G series. And we'll talk a little bit about the difference between them and the similarities. Um, it really comes down to bed size and then the style of machining center that's, that's mounted onto the bed. Um, the C-Series is a cantilever system, so uh, on the X uh, axis, it's actually mounted on two rails on the back side of the machine, and then it's a cantilever head that comes over, uh, whereas on the G-Series, which you can see behind me, this is a G-Series 2004, and what that means is that it's, it's got uh, guides on both sides of the bed, so it's a true gantry system, as you can see here with the, the longer shot. This machine behind me is a 2004. Um, the C-Series comes in a two-foot uh, distance on the Y axis, and then we can build that out from there. So just to give you a, uh, an idea, um, the smallest machine that we would build, uh, we talk in, in real estate terms, square footage, uh, it would be a 10 foot by two foot. And what that means for you, you're going to have the ability to actually have the spindle touch each end of 10 feet and each end of two feet. That's the actual distance. The machine's a little bit bigger than that. And I'll, I'll show you the bed here in a little bit. Um, we grow in two foot increments on the Y axis and then five foot increments on the X. Uh, so to give you an idea, we've got machines out there that are two feet wide and 50 feet long uh, for producing cell phone towers. Uh, we've got machines that are uh, eight feet wide. Um, I actually have a customer right now that's interested in a 14 foot wide machine. Um, so there, there's a lot of different ways that we can do that based on the application. Um, it's, it's less about uh, the machine that I have sitting here and it's more about what the customer's needs are. Uh, and then we can build the machine specific to that. And we'll talk through options as well. Um, so with that, with it being a vertical machining center, let's talk about the spindle. Uh, we've got a couple different options. Uh, we can do a Cat 40 uh, on the C series and also the BT variant of that, or uh, Cat 40 and Cat 50 on the G series. The machine behind me, again, like I said, it's a G series 2004. This is the high output package. So this has a Cat 50 spindle and it also has a ZF gearbox. And so that's gonna give you a maximum amount of torque output uh, 368 foot-pounds of torque on this machine right here. Um, and it just, again, it, it, the idea is that we build these around the customer's application, so it's all dependent on what they need. We don't want to give you something that's just way overpowered unless you need it. Um, so, for example, somebody running like aluminum extrusion. Uh, this is a 4,000 RPM machine um, as far as maximum RPM. We also have a 6,000. And then if you're getting into something like aluminum, we can offer a 12,000 RPM. Um, Along with that, and I think we've got some footage to show on this, but the benefit of a, a large bed like this is that we can run what we call pendulum mode. And the idea with that is you could be machining a part on one side of the bed while you're either putting new material on the other side or uh, doing a new setup or something like that. But the idea with it is to have 100% spindle uptime. Uh, we can only make a spindle move so fast with mechanics and whatnot eventually we have to start looking at more efficient ways to do things. And so one of those is to have a large bed where you can have the machining center transfer back and forth and you don't have to have it where the spindle's going to home position and then just park there 
for a long period of time. Um, and so you can imagine uh, if, if you look at the, your setup times on the spreadsheets that you have in your office, I'm sure, sure you can see how much time it takes to do that. But imagine being able to process a part uh, on the left side of the bed while you're, you're getting your vices located, setting up your work offsets, doing all that at, the, at that time. Um, you can do it where you're doing the same part back and forth, or you can have different parts. Again, it's, it's, it's based on the application. Um, I'm working with a customer right now who has, they want to run three different parts down the length of the bed. And again, it's not a specific thing where the bed's split in half and we're working from one side to the other. Uh, it can be any sort of increment. So you could have even like four different cells down the bed based on your needs. Um, the way that we do that safely, actually, sorry, let me, let me talk about our tool changer real quick. On the back side of the machine, there's actually a tool carousel. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to allow you to bring the tools back and forth with you up, up and down the length of this bed. You can imagine if I was all the way down something and now I've, now I've, just, uh, I've just finished my drill cycle and now I need to tap, but I had to come back over to the other side to then start that cycle, it's wasted time and we're looking for um, the most efficient way to process a part. And so that tool carousel on the back side of the machine rotates, you drop your tools in, it's a quick thing that you can do no matter where the machining center is. Um, and so there's a lot of different options with that based on the spindle size and the size of the machine. Um, but to give you an idea, I can get all the way up to uh, 24 cat 40 tools on this machine right here. Um, so with that, let's talk about safety. You can imagine with this thing sliding around everywhere, I mean, it, it moves very easily, very efficiently, back and forth. We can do about 1,100 inches per minute um, of our rapid speeds. You can imagine if somebody's standing in the way that, that this would be a, you know, a somewhat dangerous situation. So the way that we avoid that is we have laser curtains, laser barriers um, on this machine specifically. Uh, if, if you can watch me down here, we've got a laser curtain that'll actually move up and down the bed. And so the idea is as long as I'm on this side of it, the machining center can't come towards me. So it's a really effective way uh, for me to be able to get in here and uh, move something, tighten a vise. Maybe I'm actually accessing this part that's right here on the bed. Um, and now when I'm done, all I have to do is pull the laser curtain back. The machine can come back down, start machining that part. And, and we're gonna do this, you ready? I'm going to go all the way down to the other end of the machine. We're going to see if the camera can keep up. <laughs> and now I can come over here and access the parts that I have down here. And so just very quick and simple. Now the machining center is down there and I'm in a safe zone. I'm going to keep moving because I, I like messing with our, our camera folks. So now what we've done that's a little bit different. Um, that's a very effective way to do it. That's still an option. Uh, that we can provide with the machine, but uh, what we've actually done now is we have a, a laser scanner that we, we install in the machines, and that's a standard feature. And the idea is that even if um, an operator forgets to, to grab the, the laser barrier, instead of doing that, there's a proximity scanner that goes right on the, the machining center, and it's constantly looking in this area for anybody who could be in a dangerous situation. The way that it works is that it's going to uh, initially slow the machine down on the feed rate, um, to make sure that they have a chance to get out of the way. And if it gets danger close, it's gonna stop the feed. Uh, the spindle keeps moving so you don't ruin your tooling, you don't ruin your part, but it's gonna stop the machining center from actually moving towards somebody. It's a big question that we get asked about with a large machining center like this moving up and down the bed, how do you keep my, my people safe? Will it meet our safety requirements? And so the other part that I always tell people is it depends on your application, let us know about it. We can customize a lot of this um, to, to be able to help us out. And the way that we can do that, uh, we have our own proprietary controller. Uh, and so I've actually asked uh, Nick Kennedy, he's our, uh, our president owner of the company, and he's going to jump on here uh, in a second if we have him. <laughs> but what Nick's going to do is he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the controller, uh, the reasoning behind, um, you know, rather than going with some sort of standard controller, why did we go with our, our own custom controller that we've built kind of from the ground up? Nick, can you hear me? I can. You sound great. Thank you.
Uh, th sorry, it sounds like uh, they're actually having trouble hearing hearing you for some reason, Nick. So I'll, I'll just review with uh, with them what you just said, and I'm, I'm not sure what's going on here as far as our our tech side of things. Uh, but basically, what Nick was just telling us about, and Isaac, I just had something disconnect. Got it. Well, let's not worry about it. What, what Nick was basically just saying, folks, and sorry for the the technical issues. Um, this would have been much more effective if you were here present with us. <laughs> um, but basically what he's saying is that like we've built a controller that's going to be familiar for anyone coming out of a tech school. Uh, we've got a controller that we've built from the ground up, and the idea with it is we have zero limitations with it. It's our controller. So based on your application, we can make adjustments to it. But anyone who's trying to do um, any sort of um, high-speed milling or anything like that, like we, we can do that with our controller. We've got a lot of... Uh, are, are we getting them now? We're going to keep going. Um, the, the idea is that... Um, Anyone who's familiar with uh, a, 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 like a FANUC controller or something like that, this is going to feel very comfortable to them. We've had people who come in for training um, into our facility here in Ohio, and they get with the controller, and within three hours, they're like, I get it. I'm, I'm very comfortable, and it's great. The one thing I want to point out about the controller that's really nice is that, like I said, we've got a customized, customizable machine where we can make adjustments to the bed size based on your parts. Uh, the other part is that we can actually do custom work on the controller. Uh, because it's ours, we can make adjustments to it like uh, we've got a customer in Pennsylvania and they actually have a fourth axis at each end of the machine so they can run a long part here and a long part here separately as opposed to only having that fourth axis. Uh, on this machine, we, we've got a single fourth axis here on the back side that you can see over there. And if we wanted to add in another one, it's quite simple. We put it on the other end, tie it into the controller. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm moving the controller right in your way, aren't I? Um, but, but it's just a, a really nice uh, thing for them to be able to do. Um, so let's talk about oversized parts because that's a big question that we get. Um, when somebody has uh, a, a very large piece and it's on a, a standard vertical machining center, maybe it's, you've got some Haas equipment or something like that, what ends up happening is that, you know, everyone's seen it. You've got to open up the doors. I've even seen some of our customers uh, who they've actually cut a machine apart to be able to get their, um, their machine or their, their parts onto the bed. Um, or onto the, the table that's inside that machine. We hate to see that. And so what we have as an opportunity is for you to just put the part right onto the bed, have the bed built to what your needs are. Um, and, and the neat thing with that is that you can do it in a single setup. And you can ask any machinist um, when they have to run a part and say they've got a, a 40 inch by 30 inch platter inside their machine and they open up the doors and they have to run a 16 foot part. That's not necessarily like a fun, efficient thing to do because they can only run 40 inches of that part and they have to incrementally move it and move it and move it, having to take measurements every single time. And so you can imagine if you had a long run or, or a number of parts that you have to produce, that you're not going to be able to get through that quickly. A 16-foot part on this bed, it goes right on. Actually, we've got some fixtures on the back side of it that I'll show you here in a minute uh, where you could just run that part all the way down, drop it on, do it in one setup. If it's a part where you have multiple holes and say it's a, um, a round, maybe you've got some channel uh, schedule 40 pipe, you can make all your holes on, on one run, rotate 15 degrees, and do the same thing all the way down. So again, we're just looking at efficiency. Um, so I don't think that we have the, the, the video that's going to pull up for us. Understood. Then we'll, we'll just keep rolling. Folks, here's one thing that I will tell you with the technical difficulties that we are having. If you have any questions about this stuff, I have video on my computer that I'd love to share with you at some point. Um, but anyway, so the fourth axis, I know I just touched on that, but um, long extrusion, Schedule 40 pipe, anything like that, whether it's aluminum, steel, stainless, we can run all of that. Um, and then the other part is the, the fixturing. Can we grab the, oh, you have the camera. Are we able to switch to it? We can't even switch to the other camera. That's okay. Let me do this real quick, and we'll see what we can do. Can you zoom in on the bed, and I want to show them just a couple of things we have over here. So if you can see, I've got some uh, just standard Kurt vices here on the machine. We've got some pneumatic vices here on the back. And, and these are nice. There's a, there's a trigger right underneath, and we have IOs all throughout the bed um, so that it, you can drop your plane very quickly, go down, trigger the vices, grab your part, start your cycle. Uh, we can also plumb those so that there's a single switch on the end of the bed 
Um, or we can also have it where the controller is operating them. But you can imagine if I had, you know, I've got some square tube right here. I've got a subplate on the bed over here. I'll show you in a minute. I've got a magnetic vise uh, and then some more pneumatic vices there. But I've got a whole section down here on the back side of the bed where, like I said, I could drop a 16-foot part. I could be running that. So I think, I think on the bed right now, I have about seven or eight different setups um, that technically I, I could run those back to back all the way along through. And as soon as I get in this area, like I said, I'm grabbing the light curtain on the back side, pulling it over, and safely able to access the parts that are here, loading new parts on, get all the way down to the end of the bed. So it's not a machine that's just for long parts, large parts. We can do uh, basically anything that you would need. Um, so let me bring it back down and we're going to show the other parts that we have on the bed. Let's speed that up a little bit. So over here again, you can see the subplate. One of the big things that I like to point out about this, um, a 20 foot bed, let's say you've got a, a 12 foot part. You've got all kinds of space down at the other end of the machine. We've got customers that actually will get a library of subplates and the idea is that now you can have a single work offset and as long as you can locate your subplate in the same part it's a very quick setup so they'll have these stacked uh, whether they're in the tool room or right next to the machine and when they've got standardized parts that might be on the smaller side it's a very quick way to get those uh, set up on the machine and, and running quickly and you might run through your 100 200 500 parts grab the other subplate pull it on and, and just keep rolling with it this is a neat one this is uh, uh, from one of our partners Technics and it's a it's a magnetic plate, and so you can see it's got some hard stops on the bottom and on the right side of it. Uh, and, and this thing is, it, we've actually run our tap top carts for our flex arms uh, on this. Um, you, you can't necessarily see it on screen, but these are machinable blocks that we can just replace ourselves. And the last piece that I'll show you down here is the, um, the more pneumatic clamps that we have. Uh, and again, you can go right in. There's a switch right on it, very simple to operate. Um, and that's, that's how we're holding this. And this is a car, this is a, a half inch thick Blanchard ground steel with 204 half 13 holes drilled and tapped and chamfered in it um, that we run here. Um, so if you've ever purchased a flex arm from us on a cart, that's how we're making them. Um, so with that, uh, the other piece that we'll just talk about quickly is, is customization. Uh, we've got customers that are running large pieces on here where maybe the gantry needs to be raised uh, or I've had it where um, we've got a customer in New York where they've actually dropped a portion of the bed to be able to put large weldment um, in. So you, on one end of the machine, the bed comes along and it just drops off to the floor and then we put some more uh, fixturing capability in the bottom of that. Um, so outside of that, uh, that that's kind of everything that I had. If there are questions, we'll be, we'll be happy to field them now at this point. I can hear you, Nick. Uh, we, we did, we just talked about, uh, you know, three jaw, four jaw chucks, um, and whether you're doing like schedule 40 pipe, uh, aluminum extrusion, anything like that where you need to index a part in place, yeah. Oh, I mean, the. Yeah, yeah, so um, it, when we talk about um, the availability of our fourth axis, um, we, can, we can put very large pieces of material uh, under our spindle. Um, and the idea, I, we just talked to a customer the other day about putting a 20-inch pass-through um, onto the machine so that they could put very large pieces. They might have a 16-inch pipe uh, that they want to run. Um, and then again, if, if we're talking about in comparison to like a, a laser or something like that, the other part is that um, if you don't have the throughput to justify, you know, a very expensive piece of equipment like that, um, th these are these can be end up being quite affordable in those kind of situations where uh, you don't have to run three shifts all the time in order to, to be able to do something like that. So, um, yeah, just great availability. Exactly. They can't, they can't hear Nick? Okay, it sounds like I'm having a conversation with myself. That's great. Um, so, is, uh, did we have any questions from, um, from the audience? Can Kara still hear me?
Can, they, can we put any questions up on the screen or anything like that? Yes, hey, sorry about that, Joe. We have you here. Can you hear us? Hey, no problem, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I will pass the mic over to Kara here. She has some questions from the audience that we'd love to uh, have you take a crack at. <laughs> absolutely, I'm happy to. Talking for 20 minutes straight is not my, uh, my strong suit. It's answering questions and providing solutions. <laughs> All right, Joe, we're just getting the first question loaded here. So it looks, no problem. Like, it looks like what range of applications does this machine perform most efficiently? What range of applications does the machine perform most efficiently? Uh, again, I mean, the, the thing that it does well is move from one part to another. Um, obviously, the, the bed is the, the most apparent thing that you would see um, that we can do efficiently, right? So if you've got a 20-foot part, we can do it in one shot uh, as opposed to having to move it through, uh, like when we talked about oversized parts. But the other piece being that pendulum mode. When we talk about efficiency, um, you, you could have very small parts and have half a dozen of them on one side of the machine. Maybe you're doing some, you know, you're uh, face milling, drilling, and tapping some flanges. You could do half a dozen over here, and as soon as that's done, it rolls over to the other side of the machine and starts doing another half dozen while your operator is uh, removing those parts and putting new material on. So that, that's what we talk about, uh, the 100% spindle, uh, spindle time. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. Is it's, it's all about pendulum mode and efficiency. Well, great. Thank you. It looks like the next question we have here that's is... It is how would you go about machining on multiple faces? Great question. So uh, we've actually had uh, situations where maybe it's not a fourth axis application, uh, but it's a part where somebody, um, maybe they've got like a large frame that's on the bed um, for like a trailer or something like that. What, the way we would actually do that, um, we can get right angle tooling. It won't necessarily fit inside the, the tool carousel, uh, but what we would do is we would yeah. actually put a, a custom tool holder on the bed, uh, just a spindle, spindle body, body on a right angle right tool angle. because of the gearing and everything that's in there. Um, it, it can end up being uh, a little bulky. So we put that custom tool holder on the bed, uh, and then we actually, uh, our, our software engineers will actually program in uh, kind of a, we'll, we'll use the everyone's favorite verb from 2020, quarantine. Uh, we'll quarantine off a portion of that bed where you can't pass into it unless you're doing a tool change. So you don't have to worry about crashing the machine there. It'll actually stop like it's the end of the bed um, and allow you to only uh, access that when it's uh, for a tool change. Now with that, we've had customers that have put um, a double-headed horizontal uh, tool in there. So they were doing milling on some rectangular tubes. Um, yeah, so if, if somebody's interested in something like that, I, I'd be happy to share the, the footage that we have of that. I'm, I'm sorry we can't, we can't produce it right now. Well, thanks, Joe. We appreciate you uh, going on the fly here with us. The next question we have is how Absolutely. would you, the next question we have is how would you go about machining on? Sorry, we just got that one. One second. Next I can question. The answer. <laughs> That's okay. Next question is what kind of tolerance can you hold? Yeah, so uh, when we talk about tolerance, uh, repeatability-wise, uh, like on the the x-axis, I should mention one thing about that. On the x-axis, um, we've got a precision um, helical rail. On the y and the z, uh, it's a ball screw, a precision ball screw. Uh, so repeatability, I'm looking at about on the x-axis, um, 7 tenths. Um, on the y and the z, 5. Uh, position accuracy, we're looking plus minus 2 thou. The y and the z, we're looking plus minus 1 thou. OK. Thank you. It looks like the next and last question we have time for today is how does the machine evacuate chips? Great question. Yeah, so um, it's a T-slot rail system on the bed. So like on this machine where it's four feet wide, it's got six T-slot rails that run down it. Uh, and then the bed is actually open underneath. I don't think we can get a good shot of it here. Um, but the, the bed is actually shaped in, in a V. Um, and what ends up happening Oh, we're going to run with the camera? 
uh, what ends up happening is that that V-shape allows the chips to collect down towards the bottom. There's an auger that runs the length of this bed, and it's just constantly turning while the machine is running, pulling all the chips down to the end. There's a bin on the end. Um, I think they're actually going to get a shot of that over here in a second. Uh, but the idea is that... Here, I can move the... Let me get that out of your way. And, and so the idea with this is chips are falling through that bed, and you can see the auger down there between the first and second um, T-slot rail there. So that's going to move all the chips down to the far end. There's a chip bin um, that's going to collect all the chips and the coolant, recycle the coolant. Um, and then, we again, we have uh, options galore. So I can put a, a chip conveyor uh, onto the... Um, in, into the bin to evacuate those chips into, uh, you know, a barrel or whatever, however you want to do it. Um, but yeah, we're all about efficiency. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, we, we, we can get the footage you'd like out to anyone that's attending. And um, that is unfortunately what we have time Absolutely. for today. If we did not get to your questions. That, that, and that's fine. I, all but, I was going to say was if you want, um, we can take like a list of the B-roll footage and, and push that out to anybody that requests it. Great, thank you. And if we did not get to your question today, you will receive a link in your email um, after this session to schedule time with Lexi and C. So thank you guys for being here. And um, our next session is Miller Welding at 1 o'clock p.m. And actually before that, we have Trump punching at 11 a.m. So I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. And thanks, Joe, for being with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a great day. You too.